Good evening, my YouTube friends, and welcome to another bonus episode of Terror Radio Podcast. If this is your first time joining the channel, then welcome. This is a podcast dedicated in bringing you the best of horror and thriller, old time radio broadcasts, as well as original stories. I am your host, Keith, aka the radio show nerd and the two stories featured tonight were a part of a long list of other radio plays I had basically put on a playlist for New Year's Eve on the actual podcast but I wanted to make sure that I gave my YouTube family the same courtesy so without further ado this is Terra Radio the two radio series highlighted tonight are Mystery Theater and Inner Sanctum. Now, Mystery Theater was a radio series that ran on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation from 1966 to 1968. The radio play tonight is Algernon's Blackwoods, The Wendigo. And this was first broadcasted on June 1st, 1968. Following that is The Vengeful Corpse, which was first broadcasted on September 12th, 1949, on the popular radio series Inner Sanctum. So, you all know the drill. Sit back, turn down the lights, and listen to The Wendigo, followed by The Vengeful Corpse. Time to tell tales of the unaccountable, of apparitions by night and phantoms in shadow. Time to tell strange stories of fantasy and the supernatural. Mystery Theater presents The Wendigo, a strange tale of the supernatural by George Selverson, from a story by Algernon Blackwood, and starring Ed Wilson as Simpson and Robert Christie as Dr. Cathcart. There's an explanation. An explanation? They say it carries you along. It comes and calls and carries you along. Doctor. It comes and calls to you out of the silence in the voice of the bush. The voice of wind and water and the cries of animals. Doctor, please. The perfume of it drenches you, chokes you, sickens you. Uh The perfume of the dead and stinking vegetation. And you have to go. It calls you, carries you, rushes you away through the bush so that your feet burn like fire. Doctor, don't, It carries you in great leaps to your destruction. Your feet burning, the wind bursting the blood vessels behind the eyes. And then you become an animal, a living, dead thing, like the thing itself. Please and, stop it, Doctor. And then it drops you, and you stagger away to die. Doctor, stop it. Remember what you told me. There is an explanation. I am wrapped around with a wall of silence. The silent snow, the silent trees, the silent forest. The silent wall of wilderness. They all listen. The listening snow. The listening trees. There is something out there in the forest. And they listen for its voice. And uh, then there was the time of the wolf in Rat Portage. They tell this story many times of Defago. The time I fight the wolf with his bare hands. Shall I tell you that one, huh? With your bare hands. Go on, Defago. We don't doubt your fallacy for a moment. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Punkwa. Where's that old Indian? Oh, he was here a moment ago. Punkwa! Come back here and stir up the fire. <laughs> well, what about this wolf? Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry for this one, I tell you. This wolf who makes the big mistake. He picks a man who is afraid of nothing, who knows the woods better than the wolf himself. That's when it began. Defargo the guide in slouch hat and moccasins, spinning his yarns by the campfire, 
A breath of wintry wind stealing out of the forest to rustle the tent flaps and stir the blaze. Our Indian cook somewhere in the shadows. Dr. Cathcart watching Defago with cynical eyes. And the fourth of our hunting party, myself, Ray Simpson, nervous and tense, as though expecting the thing that was about to happen. I uh, come many miles in the snowshoes that time. I am very tired. I say to myself, Defago, my boy, you will sit here a while. You'll rest. But then I am sleepy. And what do you know? I am sound asleep in the snow. Now, this is not at the best of times the very best of ideas, you understand. What do you think? Along comes this Mr. Wolf. He looks at me and he tells himself, How magnificent! <laughs> what a triumph! Here is a man, says Mr. Wolf, who's overcome by the cold. And what a pleasant meal I will make myself. <laughs> but he is so wrong. I open my eyes, and there is Mr. Wolf looking into my fish with his long white teeth already. <laughs> so I say. So I say. I. What is it? I. I. What's the matter with you, man? Listen. What is it, Defago? What are you listening for? Are you trying to get a rise out of us? Quiet. Did you hear it? No, no. Not a thing. You heard nothing in the woods. No. Stop this little game. <laughs> you can't frighten me with this nonsense, Defago, but you've scared the living daylights out of Ray. You heard nothing but the wind. Yes, that's all. Did you smell something just then? Smell something? Really now, Defago? Only the fire. Why? What is it? Uh, it was nothing then. <laughs> it was my imagination. <laughs> Punkwa! Yeah, where's that Indian? The fire will go out. You'll probably find him in your tent hiding from the Wendigo after your little performance. Punkwa! You, uh, you know that story then, Doctor. Well, I'm interested in other things besides medicine and hunting moose. For example, native superstitions and the vagaries of the human mind. That's why you don't take me in with your little game. Little game? Of course. The dark forest full of unseen things surrounding us, the fire fading, working on the imagination. And then you decide to play your little trick. Very childish, Defago. If, if it does not disturb you, then why are you angry? <laughs> Childishness always irritates me, Defago. Doctor, what was that you mentioned? The Wendigo? Just some Indian nonsense. Hey, yes, that's all. Punkwa! I... Better look for that fellow. I will have a look in the tent. All right. Huh. It was a very queer thing, Doctor. Tom Foolery. You think he was acting? Certainly. Breaking off in a story that way and staring wildly into the bush. Well, don't you think he was acting? He, he went white to the gills. Didn't you see his eye? Nonsense, boy. That man has lived his whole life in the bush. There's nothing here to frighten him. Unless he's superstitious like that Indian. Superstitious? Well, you could see that, couldn't you, eh? <laughs> no, Doctor. I, I couldn't tell anything from Punkwa's face. It was like trying to read the expression on a piece of old leather. Punkwa! Where in the devil are you? He didn't want us to come up here. Said we wouldn't find so much as a fresh trail of moose anywhere in the 50 Island Water Country. Well, we haven't. We will. It's funny. What? Well, this afternoon when Defago went off into the bush looking for signs of moose, I, I, I couldn't help thinking, Doctor. What would we do if he didn't come back? <laughs> what do you think we'd do? We'd go home without him. Do you know the way? You're talking foolishness, Ray. Why would Defago disappear? He didn't. He's here. Yes. All the same, I had a feeling of what it would be like to be alone at the mercy of all this desolation that takes no notice of man. You old fool. Superstitious fool. What is it, Defago? It's the old fool. That's what it is. Where is he? What's he doing? It's what we will be doing. From now on, we uh, have no cook. The hunters will have to be cookers, too. Why? What's happened? Superstitious old fool. He's taken one of the canoes. What for? Where's he going? I know that one. He is gone. 
He's gone. Home. Then it's your own fault. Probably scared him witless with that little game of yours. But, Doctor... Now you'll have to figure out how we get along without him. Well, as for me, I'm turning in. We'll be up with the sun, Defago. And I'll expect less nonsense and more results tomorrow. Good night, Doctor. I'll be along in a minute. Defago, what was Punkwa afraid of? Uh, who knows? Uh, sometimes in the wilderness, uh, men become sick with a strange fever, a fever which makes them mad. Maybe he's afraid of that. Do you hear something? Oh, only wind. Yes, only wind. Good night. Good night, Defago. <laughs> I saw Defago move off to his tent with the lantern spilling a hundred moving shadows into the trees. I lay beside Dr. Cathcart on the bed of balsam boughs. And I felt a shadow lying between us. Not a shadow of the night. A shadow of the strange fear that had leaped upon Defago in the middle of his joking. It crept through the canvas from the world of crowding trees... I felt in my soul the profound stillness of a primeval forest when no wind stirs. Then I slept. Or so I thought. No. I was lying with my eyes open. Listening intently. With the running of my blood beating drums in my ears. Ray... Doctor, what is that sound? Listen. What? what? It's from the other tent. It's Defargo. The fool is dreaming. I'll see if he's all right. <laughs> Defargo. <laughs> Defargo, what's the matter? <laughs> Are you awake? Defago. Defago, you're dreaming. Oh. oh, that's better. What is this? A man sobbing like a child while this whole awful wilderness of woods listens? Defargo! What is it? Doctor. I hear it. What is it? Quiet! Something's happening to Defargo. Keep still. I'm going out. No! Let go. Stay where you are. I've got to help Defargo. Will you stay where you are? Will you keep quiet? Listen. Doctor. Quiet! Fire! Fire! Oh! Fire! Oh! My burning feet! Oh! Fire! Oh! Fire! Oh! My burning feet! Oh! My burning feet! My burning feet! Oh, fire! He's gone. What? Gone. Gone. Doctor. Doctor, listen to me. What? Our guide, Doctor DeFargo, he's gone. We're alone. What was that, Doctor? What is it that happened? We crept from our tent like terrified children. The gray light of dawn was dropping cold and glimmering between the trees. The lake was white beneath a coating of mist, the islands rising darkly out of it like prowling creatures. Patches of snow glistened among the clearest spaces of the bush. Defago's tent stood empty, lifeless, and there was nothing but silence. Silence and a strange, penetrating perfume invading the nostrils and taking me by the throat like an unseen hand. 
There's nothing here at all. No. Not a sign of anything. No. Only his footsteps. Footsteps. There in the snow. Yes. So far apart. He must have been leaping like a rabbit. What was it, Doctor? What was it? Something came. Mm. No. Something came for him. Something called. Nonsense. You heard it, Doctor. You know you heard I it. heard nothing. Yes. I heard something. Wind. That's all it was, wind. Wind? Where did you ever hear a wind like I that? I tell you, it was wind. That and your imagination. Defago carrying on like that, it was enough to make you imagine anything. Then why did you hold me back? What do you mean? You know what I mean, Doctor. When I wanted to go out and help Defago, why wouldn't you let me I go? I had reasons. Two reasons, yes, yes, two good reasons. What reason? I knew what that sound was. It was some sort of hurricane. I, I thought it safest not to move. And I could hear that Defago was growing mad. He might have harmed you. Nothing was disturbed, not a leaf. What kind of a hurricane is that? How do I know? It probably passed overhead. Then where is Defago? Yes. That's the point. We can't get out of this country without him. We've got to find him and help him. Defago! Defago! That's no good. He's beyond earshot. How do you know? Because we heard him go, shouting all the way. We'll have to follow his trail. Come on. Doctor. Well, we heard him run clear out of range of our hearing. What about it? How far would we hear him shouting like that? I don't know. Half a mile. But, Doctor, it all took about 15 seconds. 15 seconds? How fast can a man run? Ah, there's the end of the trail. No more snow. The trees are too thick for it here, and of course that's the way he chose to run. But how will we find him? He must have been tearing himself to pieces rushing through the bush like that. We've got to, we've got to keep going. No, no, this is no use. We'll only lose ourselves. Without the fogger, we're lost anyway. We've got to keep no, after him. No, listen to me, Ray. Defago! Nothing. Now listen, Ray. We must stop running around like frightened, superstitious women. And what do we do? We're going back to camp. We're going to organize ourselves for a systematic search. You're so rational. You're so ready with explanations. How do you know we'll ever find him? He can't be far. How can you explain it all away, Doctor? He's rushing away so fast. The crazy words he was using, that perfume in the air and that sound. You can't explain it. Ray, there's an explanation for everything. We are going to keep our heads. Or we'll lose them like the Fargo. Now, let's get going. The second time we set out from camp, we took food and matches. Dr. Cathcart carried the new 303 rifle of which he was so proud, and I took a hatchet, blazing the trees as we traveled in a wide sweep in search of Defago's trail. Ray, what is it? Come and look. Here it is. We found it. Yes. Those are the tracks of human feet, sure enough. Defago's, of yes. course. Yes. But what's this beside them? Beside them? Yes, look here. What? Animal tracks. There you have your simple explanation for the whole affair, Ray. Why? How does that explain anything? Doctor? Those big marks have been left by a bull moose. Now I know what happened. Well? The wind against it. The moose blundered into camp. It uttered a cry of alarm which we heard in the wind. Defago heard it too in his sleep. Remember the nightmare he was having? Yes, but, but why did he... He's a superstitious fellow. And that Indian had filled him with stories about the Wendigo. Ah. He suffered a temporary derangement, perhaps nothing more than panic. And now he's tracking the animal. Yes, that could be. Uh, uh, we have nothing more to fear. Uh -huh. uh, let's take a breather. And a bite of food before we go on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were right. You were right. There uh, is an explanation for everything, uh, Doctor. And if you knew the kinds of explanation that have been going through my mind... I know. Here. Take a couple of sandwiches. Thanks, Doctor. Mm -hmm. I got the water there and parched. Mm -hmm. Here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. ah, it's a relief. Mm -hmm. That's the second time you've mentioned this Wendigo thing. What is it, Doctor? Oh, only nonsense. Yeah. Indian legend of some sort. Well, about the size of it. <laughs> oh, it's funny the comfort I feel. Sitting on a on a stone in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> looking at the father's footprints. Yes, telling such a normal story. Mm. Hunter trailing moose. <laughs> <laughs> it's a go thing. Did it? 
Did it have something to do with Ponqua dessert? Oh, perhaps. Hmm? What, what sort of a thing is it supposed to be, Doctor? Huh? Well, in this part of the country, when an Indian goes mad, they say he has seen the Wendigo. Oh. The Wendigo is a state of mind. Yes, 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 you could call it that. There, there is no such thing. No such thing? What they say, yeah, up here. Yeah, they say out here are spaces no man can penetrate. This creature lives there, this Wendigo. Creature? The Wendigo. Huh? They say it's a kind of animal. It's a state of mind. Kind of animal? Doctor, look here a minute. What is it? The moose tracks. You must be a big one. You're right. Big round tracks. Look here. Does this look like a hoof mark to you? No. Caribou? Oh, that would be hoof marks. Bear? No. No, it isn't bear. Doctor, I think... I think we'd better get moving again. Yes. You loaded it, Doctor. It's a bear track. Is it? What are you doing? Why are you kneeling there? Uh, I... I thought I smelled something. You're acting like a fool. Do you want to lose your mind like the Fago? And you think he's gone after all. No, no, I told you what that was. Get your nose out of that track. You're out of your mind. Dr. Cathcart... Don't you think we, we should turn back? Why do you talk such nonsense? There's, there's perfume in that track. Oh. <laughs> if you let your mind go like that, there's no knowing what you'll imagine next. We've lost enough time. We've got to find a fargo. We went on mile after mile. I dreaded the essential tapping of the axe on the massive trunks. The sound went before us into the dim forest where... Something was waiting and listening. The doctor pressed on faster and furious like a man who denies something he really believes. And the tracks became increasingly strange and unbelievable. There's an explanation. An explanation? How much did you measure? Eighteen feet. Eighteen feet from one step to the next. Well, let's check back. We... Must be missing some tracks. No, no, there it is in the snow. Defago took 18-foot leaps. So he'd been lifted and carried. Lifted and carried by what? The beast. That's what they say. They say it carries you along. It comes and calls and carries you along. Doctor? It comes and calls to you out of the silence uh, with the voice of the bush, the voice of wind uh, and water and the cries of animals. Doctor, please. The perfume of it drenches you, chokes you, sickens you. The perfume of dead and stinking vegetation. Uh, and you have to go. It calls you, it carries you. Uh, it rushes you away through the bush so that your feet burn like fire. That's what he said, didn't defeat a fire. Uh, doctor, don't, it please. It carries you in a great screaming leaps to your destruction with your feet burning and the wind bursting the blood vessels behind the eyes. Uh, and then you become an animal. The living, dead thing like the thing itself. And it drops you, and you stagger away to die. Dr. Cathcart, will you stop it, please? This is not like you remember what you told me. There is an explanation. Yes, an explanation. Let's look ahead. Check those footprints. And the animals. Yes. Now, it, it, it just may be that our eyes are playing us tricks, sir. Or else... Yes? Yes, Ray. What is it? Those... Aren't Defago's footprints? What? We've... We've lost them somehow. Where did he go? Lost them? How could we lose them? And they end here, both sets. There! You see, we didn't lose them. There are still two sets of tracks. Where did they go? Up in the air? Yeah, there, there's an explanation. An explanation. And those aren't Defago's. Look at them. There were two animals here. We've lost Defago somewhere back. No, we haven't. Those are Defago's. This is the end of the trail. This is where it left him. Then where is he? Defago! Don't! Don't, don't call him! Don't call him! The big trees closed in on us like gangsters. I stared around with no power of thought, no judgment. The feet that printed the surface of the snow had come this far. And then nothing... And here were Defago's prints, neat, round duplications of the strange animal track. The feet that produced them had therefore changed, and my mind reared up with loathing and incredulous bewilderment. 
Don't call him. Don't. Doctor, get hold of yourself. We're going back. But we have to find a We'll Fargo. never find him. We'll die in these woods without him. That's better. Better? Why? I tell you, we're going back. We have to give it up. But, Doctor, please. We have to give it up. Oh. Oh. All right, then. Let's go back. Good. If we hurry, we can make the camp by nightfall. Yes, yes, of course. We'll have to... We will have it all explained. You'll see, Ray. Yes, Hopelessly lost. It happens in these woods, even with a man like Defargo. There's no chance. We've done everything. There he is. What? Coming through the woods. It's Defargo. Go away. It's Defargo. Defargo! It isn't Defargo. It is Defargo! You see? No. It isn't Defargo. Yes. Not anymore. What do you mean? Keep him away. Keep him away. Doctor, please. Doctor. Put down that gun. Keep him away, Doctor! You're out of your mind. It's all a lie. Give me that gun. All a lie! Superstition, I defy you! Doctor, control it. All in the mind. You're nothing. Here it comes, and it's nothing. Listen to it come. It comes for me. I'm coming. Oh, the fire. The fire. The fire. Oh, the fire. There's Defargo here in the snow. He looks no different, except that he's dead. And I'm alone. I'm wrapped with a wall of silence. The silent snow. The silent forest. The silent wall of wilderness. They all listen. The listening snow. The listening trees. There is something out there in the forest. And they listen for its voice. Mystery Theater has presented The Wendigo, a tale of the supernatural by George Selverson, based on a story by Algernon Blackwood. In the cast... Robert Christie as Dr. Cathcart, Ed Wilson as Simpson, and Murray Westgate as Defago. Sound effects were by John Sliz, and technical operation by Robert Burt. This is Bill Lorne speaking. invite you through the creaking door for another inner sanctum mystery and remind you to
<laughs> Tonight's inner sanctum mystery, The Vengeful Corpse, was written by Ed Adamson and Bob Sloan, and stars Barbara Weeks in the role of Sarah, with Carl Swenson as Paul. Inner Sanctum is presented by the Emerson Drug Company of Baltimore, Maryland, makers of Bromo Seltzer. Remember, Bromo Seltzer is compounded by registered pharmacists. It fights headache three ways. Bromo Seltzer helps your headache quickly, pleasantly, and it also soothes the upset stomach and jangled nerves that may team up with it. No wonder druggists report that of all headache products dispensed to their fountains, the overwhelming favorite is Bromo Seltzer. Please, friend, absolute silence. We want it so quiet you can hear a head drop. In the small hillside New England cemetery, a chill evening wind stirs the leafless trees with a complaining murmur. A blood-red moon probes through the branches with grotesque fingers, touching the faded headstones with their eerie light. The frail, drawn-faced young woman sits on an old stone bench, listening acutely to the rustling of the branches, as if to capture some word whisper of the dead, forgotten past. Sarah! Sarah! Sarah, where are you? Oh, Paul, I'm here, over here. Sarah, I've been looking all over for you. What are you doing out here, anyway? I was called out here, Paul. What? The wind. There was a voice on the wind, and it called me to come out here. That's just in your mind, darling. No voice called you. Yes, Paul, it did. I recognized the voice. You recognized it? Then whose voice was it, dear? It was old and tired and sort of cracked. And yet I could recognize it as my own voice. You heard your own voice? Yes, Paul. And it was strongest right here where I'm sitting now. Among my family grave. Hello there. Oh, that's all. Hello. It's just Mr. Griffin, the caretaker. I asked him to help me look for you. Oh, well, I see you found your wife all right, eh, Mrs. Seaton? Yes, I found her, Mr. Griffin. I thought I saw Mrs. Seaton come to the graveyard here earlier. I didn't expect she'd still be... Well, what's wrong? What's the matter, Mr. Griffin? Just that I get sort of a funny kind of feeling every time I pass this grave here. What do you mean? What are you talking about? That grave, that one there, the one right next to you. Why? What's the matter with it? Well, ain't you noticed there's only one name on the headstone? The, the first name, Hester. That's strange. My family name is Randolph. Wasn't this woman a Randolph? Oh, you don't know the story? Uh, what story are you talking about? Uh, the kin who buried this Hester woman didn't think she deserved the family name, so they left it off the headstone. Why? Why didn't they give Hester her full name? Because they didn't want anybody to know who she was, I guess. You see, Hester was burned at the stake for witchcraft. Witchcraft? Uh-huh, that's what they say. Uh, Mr. Griffin, my wife is an ill woman as it is. Let I him go on, Paul. No, but Sarah... What I... else, Mr. Griffin? Well, that's all, Mrs. Seaton, except that Hester claimed at the stake that they were burning an innocent woman. She could be heard shouting it as the flames licked around her. She threatened with her last breath to get even someday. How could she get even? I don't know, but... According to the story I heard, Hester said that this here town owed her the years of her life that they took away. Well, now, this is completely ridiculous. It's only a Mr. legend. Mr. Griffin, no... tell me, how many years ago did all this happen? Well, it's, it's right here on the headstone, you see. Hester, a lost soul, born October the 13th, 1759, died... Good heavens. What's wrong? Oh, look, Mrs. Seaton... The date of Hester's death. It's worn away. Sarah? Yes, yes, Paul. What are you doing out of bed? When did you get up? Why, just a minute ago, I... I can't sleep. She keeps calling me. I hear her voice right here in this room. Just... Just a few minutes ago. What? She was begging me to help her, telling me she never really lived and pleading with me to bring her back to life. No, Sarah. You... I thought I saw her. No, Sarah. Believe me. She was th- dressed in a black 
dress, and there was a large W on it. That's for which. And in her hand, she held a flaming torch. I'm going to call the doctor, darling. This is not... Someone's at the door. All right, I'll see who it is. No, wait, wait. I'll go. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Seaton. Why, Judge Foster. I hope I didn't awaken you folks. I saw a light in the window. Oh, so that's I... all right, Judge. Come right in. Ah, thank you. I'm sorry to bother you this time of the night, Mr. Seaton, but I was looking out of my window on the other side of the cemetery, and I thought I saw something or someone prowling around out there, and I wondered if they come over this way. Who was it? Oh, I don't know. Someone carrying a torch. A torch? Uh, go on, John. Well, of course, it could be that my eyes were playing tricks on me. They're not so good. But uh, as far as I could make out, it was a woman dressed in black. You saw this woman, Judge? You're sure? Well, I'm pretty sure I saw her. Of course, it's kind of dark out there, but it looked to me like there was something on the front of her dress. What What do you mean? Well, there was the letter W. A big white letter W on it. Hester. It was Hester, just as No, I... no, Sarah. Hester? Who's Hester? Hester Randolph. That's who you saw. She was in this house, no, too. No, it must be a trick. See, someone is trying to frighten you to make you worse. Now, now, hold on, folks. Hester Randolph was buried over a hundred years ago. She's come back to life. Mrs. C. Uh, no. Judge, my wife is ill. She doesn't realize what she's saying. I know Hester's alive. You didn't believe me, Paul, but Judge Foster saw her, too. Well, I didn't see anybody who's been dead a hundred years. What is it, Judge? Don't you smell it? Yes. Something burning. The odor of burning flesh. Look, out there on the back lawn, stuck in the earth, a torch, a flaming torch. <laughs> Sir, I tell you, it's useless to have me dig up this crate. I've got the note, Paul. It's the only way I'll be sure. Now, careful, Mr. Seaton. You're just about deep enough for the coffin now, if it's still there. Judge, I don't know how you can sanction a thing like this. Well, Mr. Seaton, you see, I want to be sure, too. Yeah, but it's ridiculous. Huh? Yeah, you've struck wood with the shovel. Yes, it's the coffin, all right. You better go easy now. That wood is soft with age and half rotted away. Oh, I think we can open it now. Wait, I'll give you a hand with the lid. All right. There's something inside it. It's a body, all right. Only it isn't a woman's. You can still make out the face. It's Griffin, the caretaker. Dr. Norton, I am so glad that you've gotten here. I came as soon as I could, Mr. Seaton. What's wrong? She's worse, Doctor. Oh? Much worse. She's been in her room all day, hiding like a frightened child. I, I think the me uh, reading made her worse. Reading? What reading? Well, for the past few days, she's been reading books about her family history. Why did you let her have them? Well, because at first, they seemed to quiet her. Since the night we found Mr. Griffin's body in that grave, she's wanted to know more and more about Hester Randolph. Paul. Oh, Sarah. Uh, Dr. Norton's here, dear. You, you've got the warning, Paul, before it's too late. Warn who, Mrs. Seaton? Judge Foster. He's in danger. Hester will kill him next. What? It's in the records of the court. The magistrate who sentenced Hester to death at the stake was a man named Foster. Now, Mrs. Seaton, you're just upset. Please, believe me. Judge Foster is a direct descendant of that magistrate. Sarah, Sarah, Hester's dead, dear. The dead can do no harm. Oh, Paul, you don't understand. She's killed one man already, and now she's going to kill another. She swore she'd get that revenge on the magistrate and on the man who was her accuser. Seaton, all this took place over a hundred years ago. Then what about Mr. Griffin? Well, what do you mean, sir? He had the same name, too. According to the record, Hester's accuser was a man named Richard Griffin. So, Judge Foster, my wife insisted that I come over here and warn you about Hester. Well, thank you, Mr. Seaton, for troubling, but I'm not a bit worried about the similarity of names. Well, I didn't admit it to Sarah, but the 
coincidence with Griffin was strange. Oh, the dead never frightened me, Mr. Seaton. But thank you for coming over. Oh, by the way, can I drive you home? No, thanks. Dr. Norton is waiting for me outside. Good night. Good night, Mr. Seaton. Now, where did I put those glasses of mine? Oh, sure, I left them here on the table. Wait. Say, who opened that door? Is, is that you come back, Mr. Seaton? Well, confound it, whoever it is, answer me. Who's out there? Who, who is it? What? Who, who are you? Your conscience has been dimmed by the evil of your acts. Who am I? Mark you well this torch I light. Now mark you also, my God. This black garment I wear and upon which you had impressed the wicked lips. W. Hester. I, Satan's magistrate, Hester Randolph. You are listening to Inner Sanctum, brought to you by... people are turning to Bromo Seltzer all the time because it fights headache fast and fights it all three ways. First, it quickly fights the pain of the headache itself. Then it soothes upset stomach and jumpy nerves that may often team up with a headache. That's right, folks. Bromo Seltzer does three jobs, fast and pleasantly. Just put a teaspoonful of Bromo Seltzer in a glass and add water. It fizzes immediately, sparkling and refreshing, ready to help your headache all three ways. Why wait, folks? Keep that familiar blue bottle handy at home and at your place of business. Yes, friends, it's smart to be prepared for headaches at all times with Bromo Seltzer. It's on sale at all drugstores. Get a bottle today or tomorrow. Simply ask for... <laughs> Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer. That has the character. You know, that's the way a dame gets when she's burned up. Makes a specter of herself. Mm. You know, folks, I kind of feel sorry for old Judge Foster. When Hester showed up, the poor guy didn't know which way to turn. Uh, I mean, to turn away which which. They should have believed Sarah Seaton. She sure had Hester dead, or rather alive, to write. Yes, indeed. It's a wise descendant who knows her own forebears. Particularly the grave-minded one. Hmm. <laughs> well, now, let's get back to our flaming fable. And see what's cooking for the next stanza. Paul. Paul, wake up. Mm. Paul, please, wake up. Oh, sure. What's the matter, darling? I've just had a terrible dream. I'm afraid. No, you... I, I dreamt that Judge Foster was killed tonight by Hester. You did warn Judge Foster, didn't you, Paul? Yes, yes, of course, sir. <clears throat> Where are you going, dear? I'm getting dressed. I'm, I'm going down to tell the judge myself. You are staying here. Oh, please, no. please let me go. It means the man's life. You heard what Dr. Norton said, dear. Under no circumstances are you to leave the house. You're to talk to no one. Why am I being kept here like a prisoner? Why don't you let me speak to... Oh, what, what was that? It sounded like a door banging in the wind. Yes. Oh, there it is again. It's in the rear of the house. Didn't you lock that back door? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I did. I'd better see what happened. Wait, I I'm going with you. I I'd better turn on a light here in the kitchen. No, you won't have to. I can see it's the door all right. Guess I must have forgotten to spring the latch of that. Paul! Out there, by the trees at the end of the lawn. I thought I saw a figure. All right, just stay here, dear. I'll be right back. No one out here, Sarah. You sure? Positive. Probably just a shadow. i 
standing here, Sheriff. Right here at the back door when I heard her scream. And there wasn't a sign of her when you got back here at the door? Not a sign of her. Well, folks just don't vanish into thin air, Mr. Seaton. She must be around here someplace. I've got to find her before it's too late. Too late? What do you mean by that? I, I don't know, really. I, I, I have a feeling that... Oh, now, you're not going to tell me about dead witches returning, too, are you? Don't tell me you believe in that stuff. I don't know what to believe. Sheriff, is that you, Sheriff? Yes, who's there? Dr. Norton. You'd better come with me, Sheriff. I just discovered something on the side of the road about a mile away. Mr. Seaton, I, I think you'd better wait here. What is it, Dr. Norton? What have you found? I'd rather you'd wait, as I said before, until we're sure. What are you trying to hide from me? I guess you better speak up, Doctor. If it's something that concerns Mr. Seaton, maybe he should know. All right, Sheriff. When I made the turn into the road, my headlights caught it in a ditch. I wasn't sure at first, so I stopped the car and got out. There was a body in the ditch. A charred body. Switch on the flashlight. There. Sarah. Right. Just a moment, Mr. Seaton. Dr. Norton has made a mistake. What? This corpse isn't your wife. I can tell by that ring. It's the ring that Judge Foster always wore. <laughs> Oh, yes, Sheriff. Any news yet? Well, why can't your men find her? It's been six hours already. No, I haven't heard a word. Yes. Please call me as soon as you hear anything, will you? Who's there? Who is it? Oh, open the door. Hurry. Sarah. Yes, yes, quick, let me in. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, thank the Lord you're all right. Darling, where have you been? What happened to you? Wait, lock the door quickly. You... She, she doesn't know I've come back. She's still looking for Who? me. Who? Hester. She was out there, Paul. That's why I ran from the house. She called to me from the road, made me go with her. Uh, go where? To the cemetery. She kept me there, torturing me, begging me to change places with her. Darling, you're not making sense. Please, please, believe me. We've got to get away from here tonight. Right now. She'll kill me if we don't. She wants my life for the one she never lived. Now, stop it. Stop. <laughs> now, get hold of yourself. There is no such woman as Hester Randolph. But I saw her. I spoke to her. But the woman you saw is somebody else, somebody living, who wants you to believe that she's Hester. She wants everybody to believe it. But why, Paul, why? Because she's a cold-blooded murderess. She's killed two people already, and she's trying to drive you out of your mind completely. But then who? Who could it be? I wasn't sure before. Now I'm almost positive. It's Dr. Norton. Dr. Norton? Now, you saw this, Hester, Sarah. What was she like? Oh, I, like a ghost. Hmm? Like a shadow in the light. You, you can see her face, and yet you can see through it. Beyond. No. That was just an illusion created by the night, dear. Oh. And perhaps some other tricks of a clever, scheming woman. You'll see. I'll prove that Dr. Norton is... That's the back door. That's blown open again. Leave it. We've got to get out of here. No, no, you stay here. I'm going to see who opened that door. Please hurry. Don't leave me alone so long. Please, not for the moment. Paul! Huh? What, what is it, Sarah? Don't come in here. Don't come back. Run away as fast as you can. What's the matter? Don't come in here. Leave here. Over there, in the hall. She's there. Where? 
I don't see that. Good Lord, you've broken the mirror. What? You shot it yourself. No. It can't be. I can't be her. And yet I saw her face. But it was my face, too. Sarah. It was you. You all the time. I am Hester, fair gentleman. It is warming to have such a friend as you to stand beside me in this mockery of justice. Oh, Sarah, Sarah. Sarah. Run. Run as fast as you can, Paul. I was wrong. I haven't killed her. Run. Sarah, I've got to help you. I've got to explain to you that you... But I'm not Sarah. Not anymore. Can't you see who I am? Can't you see who's taken my place? Sarah, listen to me. I love you. Please, please, come back to me. Sarah's gone. Now I can live the years they took from me. Sarah. See in my hand this pistol. He will bid it, I say. He will come with me. Still no answer, Sheriff. Sir Dr. Norton, I can't understand it. Mr. Seaton was home when I called just 15 minutes ago. I warned you, Sheriff, to have that house closely watched. Well, I can't do a hundred things at once. I've got every available deputy out looking for Mrs. Seaton. Don't you realize she may have gone back to their house? Don't you realize that she's the one who might be Hester? Mrs. Seaton? Hester? What the deuce are you talking about? I'm talking about dual personality. Mrs. Seaton is suffering from a nervous breakdown. And it's entirely possible that she's the one who killed Griffin and Judge Foster. Well, you should have told me this before, Doctor. Come on, we're getting right over to the Seaton house. Here, Paul. They buried Hester's body here. Dishonored and unnamed. But, Paul, you believe in my innocence? Yes, Sarah. We better go back, dear. Back? Just to the house. Very cold here. It's cold everywhere, Paul. I feel the chill of death coming near me. You and I are going back. Back through time. To an age where no one can harm us. This torch I hold. To free us forever. No, wait. Now, Sarah, please, listen. Now, try to understand. You... Heal your mind, the flames will be of no pain. I know, because I've been through such a death before. No. Now, Sarah, wait. <laughs> Gives you such fast, 
pleasant three-way relief. It's true, Mr. Weiss. Bromo Seltzer is so pleasant to take, and it works so fast to help your headache all three ways. Yes, Bromo Seltzer speedily fights the headache pain itself. Then it goes right to work to soothe the upset stomach and jangled nerves that often may team up with a headache. Try it next time you get a headache. Prove to yourself just how fast it works to help your headache all three ways. We've tried a lot of headache products, but it's Bromo Seltzer from now on for our family. You'll say the same thing, too, once you've discovered Bromo Seltzer. So get a bottle today and be prepared at all times to fight a headache fast all three ways. It's smart to keep Bromo Seltzer both at home and at your place of business. That's right, folks. Remember, Bromo Seltzer gives you fast three-way help for a headache. It's on sale at all drugstores. Caution, use only as directed. If headaches recur or persist, see your doctor. Get Bromo Seltzer today and... I you to tune in again next Monday at the same time to Inner Sanctum, which is brought to you for your entertainment every Monday by... <laughs> this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That's the show for tonight. I want to thank you all for listening. And remember, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash terror1970 or you can find me on Instagram at Radio Show Nerd or on Twitter at Radio Show Nerd 1. And you can always leave me a comment below, respectfully, or if you want to drop me a line on my email, feel free to contact me at Radio Show Nerd at gmail.com. Look forward to another episode on Friday, as well as another video on Saturday for my segment sinister saturdays again this is your host keith aka the radio show nerd signing off